So today we're talking about why or the real reason that there's a serpent in the center of the medical symbol, also known as the star of life. A lot of people see this all the time and never question it, never think twice about a serpent being in the middle of that symbol. And even if you maybe think that you know what it is, some people think that it's about Asclepius, and we're going to be talking about Asclepius, it goes a lot deeper than that. Now, I didn't even expect to be talking about this today, but it's something that we're going to dive into. And the reason why that is, is because we're reading a book called The Testimony of Truth, which is a banned book that gives the story of the Garden of Eden from the serpent's perspective. Now, we're going to finish that today, but this ties into the symbol in the center of the medical symbol or the star of life. Now, if you haven't seen the other videos in this series, that's okay. You don't need to have seen them to understand what we're talking about today. But if you do enjoy today's video, Check out that playlist on the testimony of truth because we talk about the serpent uh, from the Garden of Eden story from the serpent side of the story. Uh, if God is actually imprisoning souls, it's a really interesting uh, book and dive into banned knowledge in the past. So really, really good. Also, if you enjoy my work, hey, please like and subscribe. We want to get this information out there when you like and subscribe, help spread it around. So please do so. All right. So. As I said, we're taking a look at this book called The Testimony of Truth, and it's a very serpentine book. And as you know, it, it tells the story of the Garden of Eden from the serpent's point of view, where essentially the serpent is saying that God is evil, God is actually the devil, um, or, or at least the author of The Testimony of Truth is saying that, that the God, God is evil, God is trapping humans, um, souls into human bodies, imprisoning them, that the Garden of Eden was actually a trap. And that's why God made knowledge forbidden so that humans would stay in this low state of consciousness and not understand what they are. And so this is a very antithetical to, to the way no, things are normally looked at. But now we're getting into the topic of, well, serpents. And the reason why I bring this up today, because if we take a look at the testimony of truth. And we see this, this entire section here was about the Garden of Eden from the serpent's perspective. Uh, oh, actually, hold on. That's not... One second. We're going to get to that section later. Right now, we're looking at the testimony of truth. All right, here we go. That's right. So, um, as you remember last time, the whole point was saying criticizing God. What kind of God is this that he maliciously refuses Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge? That God asks Adam, where are you? And what kind of God doesn't have foreknowledge? And that God is a, a malicious grudger and holds grudges because he casts Adam out from the uh, garden, Adam and Eve from the garden, and never lets them return, and just lists all these terrible things that God does. And it's basically saying, God, God is terrible, God is awful, God is actually the devil, and those who can't understand that, those who can't see that, are blind. The serpent was actually the one that was bringing truth. Now, this is really interesting because we're going to continue to talk about serpents here. And it says, And in one place, Moses writes, He made the devil a serpent for those whom he has in his generation. Also, in the book which is called Exodus, it is written thus, He contended against magicians when the place was full of serpents according to their wickedness, and the rod was in the hand of Moses, which became a serpent, and it swallowed the serpents of uh, the serpents of the magicians. So first of all, and and this is all going to tie in. This is really important to understand. This this backstory is really important to understand as we explore why there is a serpent in the center of the medical symbol or the star of life. And first of all, they they they're just talking about all the different times that the serpents in the Bible. First, they say that they made the devil a serpent. And you're going to see that's that's the opposite view of the testimony of truth. But then it just talks about, uh, you know, different times that serpents occurred in the Bible. They talk about the time when uh, Moses was going to the Pharaoh and wanted to have the people be released from slavery. And two of Pharaoh's magicians or priests came forward and they uh, cast their rods onto the ground and their rods transformed into serpents. Well, Moses cast his rod onto the ground, it transformed into a serpent, and ate the other two serpents. Um, but now it 
now here here's here's the interesting part and it is written he made a serpent of bronze and hung it on a pole now this should start to sound familiar because of that symbol in the center of the star of life the medical symbol is a serpent wrapped around a pole so this is this is important and this is going to connect to what we're talking about here so and it is written he made a serpent of bronze and hung it upon a pole when for those who gaze upon the serpent none will destroy him and those who will believe in this bronze serpent will be saved for this is christ who believed in him have received life those who do not believe will die so um And, and, and it, it goes on to criticize uh, those who don't understand who Christ is, right? It says, and you who do not understand Christ spiritually, when you say we believe in Christ, for this is the way Moses writes in every book. The book of the generation of Adam is written for those who are in the generation of the law. They follow the law and they obey it. So the, the author of the testimony of truth and the associated group, the Gnostic Christians, they're against following these strict laws. And they're about what is the whole point of the testimony of truth is to look within and know who you are. And when you know who you are, you will be your own savior and you will wear the crown unfading. That's the message of the gospel of truth. And you can see, or I'm the testimony of truth. And in the testimony of truth, you're seeing that they're associating the serpent with Christ. So, whereas it's saying that according to Christians, which would ultimately become Christian orthodoxy, which says that the serpent is the devil, they say, no, God is the devil. And they're saying that the serpent is Christ. And I'm going to come back to this in a minute because this is important. Um, but we're going to come back to this, the, the idea of, of, of the serpent being Christ. But you can see how it's a total opposite perspective where normally um, the serpent is regarded as the devil, but they're saying, no, the serpent is Christ. And it's uh, interesting because, you know, typically the serpent is associated with Lucifer. Now, if you haven't seen my video called Jesus Christ is Lucifer or Jesus is Lucifer, check that out because Christ and Lucifer are actually the same archetypes. They represent the same sort of thing. That is human liberation, coming to know oneself and becoming God. Both Lucifer and Christ rep are representatives of that. So you have this association with not of, of like Christ and Lucifer as the serpent, but understanding who Christ truly is. And they're saying that what would become mainstream Christianity, they don't understand, right? It says, and, and, um, and you do not understand Christ spiritually when you say we believe in Christ. So we're going to come back to this. This is really important. But I want to delve into the actual symbol here. Because if we take a look at this, it says, does the serpentine symbol of healing have a biblical origin? And so you see, this is actually the flag of the World Health Organization. And we have the serpent twine, uh, you know, intertwined around this rod. Now, here it says it's one of the most, and this is from um, armstronginstitute.org. It says it's one of the most widely recognized universal symbols of medicine and healthcare. It's used around the world by countless medical outlets and most notably front and center on the flag of the United Nations World Health Organization. But where did this popular and misunderstood symbol come from? And uh, as a reminder, you'll see this on ambulances and in the ER and all over the place. Now, the snake entwined staff symbol is known as the rod of Asclepius, and it traces back to the Greek god of healing. Asclepius, who is mentioned by Homer in the Iliad in the 8th century BCE, and whose cult developed especially from the 6th century onward. So statues of this god appear from at least the 4th century uh, BCE, and depictions generally show him holding a rod with a snake coiled around it. Now, different theories have been given for the meaning of the symbol, such as the snake shedding its skin as a symbol of regeneration and healing. And so you can see a picture here of Asclepius 
with holding a rod with a snake wrapped around it. And this is usually, you, you know, most people don't know where the symbol comes from, but those who do know usually think that it ends here. Um, but it actually traces earlier than this. And it says here, but is there a deeper meaning to this? An original source for the Greek symbol. So a number of Greek stories either parallel or are derived from biblical sources. And as we take a look at one of these stories here that can be found in the Bible. So a biblical story dated to 1410, 1410 BCE, which is much, much earlier, describes the Israelites sojourn in the wilderness around the land of Edom. The Israelites had become impatient with the long route and began blaspheming God and condemning Moses for bringing them out in the Egypt, uh, out of Egypt to starve. So basically, you know, if you know the story of Moses, uh, the Israelites are enslaved by the Pharaoh. He go, Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go. He has to send all these plagues, ends up killing all the firstborn children of Egypt, which is not so nice because they didn't do anything. Anyway. But they end up liberating the Israelites, um, which is a good thing. But, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> God, God was not too great in the whole killing, killing the babies thing. Not great. Uh, but they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And what happens was they started to run out of food and they started to get hungry. And so what happened was God sent manna from heaven. So this type of food, this bread would fall from heaven and this is how the people survived. They would eat this bread called manna. And they complained about the miraculously supplied bread from heaven, manna, where they said, we detest this wretched food. The reason why they say this was because, well, you know, they ate it day after day after day after day after day. Um, and so God gets angry at them <laughs> because... And remember, see how well this fits in with uh, the testimony of truth saying that God is the devil, where you have this God killing firstborn children of, of the, that are completely innocent. Uh, you have this God causing people to wander around in the desert and get lost. And now the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. So when they say fiery serpents, what this means is venomous serpents. So God in this story sends in venomous serpents and many people are dying because of all these serpents that God has sent among the people. And this fits in, by the way, with the testimony of truth, because in one of the passages in the testimony of truth, it lists all these horrible things that God does. And it says at the end, it says, and God does this to those who, who worship him, <laughs> like those who follow and believe this, in this God. God does these terrible things too. So yeah, so God is sending in these venomous serpents to kill his own people. Um, and the Israelites quickly asked for relief from the plague and Moses prayed on their behalf. So, you know, Moses says, hey, God, I know you're busy sending in all these snakes to, to kill everyone, but maybe not, maybe don't. And so he asks God for to to for help in some way. And God gave Moses a peculiar, a peculiar set of instructions. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent or a venomous serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and set it upon the pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he looked upon the serpent of brass, he lived. So God's solution to this was say, hey, get a pole and make a brass serpent and, you know, put it somewhere. And then anyone who gets bit by these venomous snakes, if they look at the serpent that you have created, they'll be healed. So now what's really interesting about this story, and there's more to it that we're going to get to and see how this ties into Christ and, and Lucifer and all that. But you can see here in a much earlier story of an association of a serpent and a pole related to healing. Those who are sick 
or, you know, had been bitten by a venomous snake, would look upon the pole and they would be healed. And here is a, here's a depiction uh, that you guys can see of the um, serpent wrapped around this pole that all these people, you know, they're not feeling so great and they're looking up at the pole so that they will be healed. And uh, it continues, this must have been a sizable object for the, vast, for the vast encampment of Israelites to see it. It must have taken some time to construct as well, during which time many Israelites may have continued to die due to snake bites. So they're, they're basically talking about, okay, well, while they're making this thing, all these people are dying. And the following verse continues with Israel's journey into the wilderness. And the next mention of the special pole occurs some 700 years later. So now it came to pass that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the, bra the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did offer to it, and it was called Nehushtan. So they uh, basically destroyed it. But now what's really interesting is you see, in addition to destroying this pillar, they also destroy um, the Asherah. Check out my video called God's Secret Wife, because it talks about how Asherah, was this feminine goddess who was basically the goddess of nature uh, that was removed from the Bible. Um, it, there's certain places like this where it still remains, but in general, um, it had been, you know, taken out. So check that out for, for another interesting story. But uh, that's not what we're talking about today. And again, you can see the picture of the Star of Life, it's called with that serpent wrapped around the pole in the center. And it says, could this have been the inspiration for the rod of Asclepius? Several researchers think so. And this story is generally given when discussing the origins of the rod of Asclepius. A serpent wrapped around a rod related specifically and directly to healing and eventual pagan worship. Surely this is more, uh, more than coincidence. So essentially it's saying is that most people attribute the symbol to the Bride of Asclepius, but this is a much, much earlier story, much earlier. And it's, you know, about a serpent around a pole that deals with healing. So it's very on point with that. But if you notice as well, this idea of a serpent being wrapped around this pole, and then one is healed when they look upon it. You see, the Gnostics, in the testimony of truth, look at this like Christ. And they look at like, uh, they, there's this equation, e equating of Christ to this. Because, and if we, here, let's, let's bring it back to um, the testimony of truth here. It says, again, it is written, he made a serpent of bronze and hung it upon a pole, which for those who will gaze upon the bronze serpent, none will be destroyed. And the one who will believe in this bronze serpent will be saved. For this is Christ. Those who believed in him have received life. Those who did not believe will die. So, essentially, the, the whole point is saying that one needs to understand Christ as being a figure that not one is worshiping, not one that is uh, needing to um, have faith in or believe in, that basically that's what Orthodox, what would become Orthodox Christianity. That's what they do. They believe in Christ as, as a being that, that one has to worship, that one has to have faith in. Whereas in the testimony of truth, Christ is looked at as a figure that is about, um, or not just in the testimony, not just the testimony of truth, but the Gnostic Gospels in general, that Christ is a figure that's just trying to teach you that you are God. He's not someone to be worshipped in the way that Christianity does. In certain Gnostic sects, uh, sects like the Carpocratians and the Marcellians, 
Christ was looked at as a human, but a human who had basically remembered what he is. And that is being a divine being. And he was a teacher. And the Marcellians and the Carp Carpocratians believed that with enough, you know, study and, and development of the self, you could be equal to Jesus or even surpass Jesus. And they had the image of, the image of Jesus next to the images of Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle. So they didn't, it was completely different from Orthodox mainstream Christianity, this idea of having to worship a God um, to be able to save oneself. When what it's truly about is about not worshiping a God, but realizing that you can become God. And the whole point of the testimony of truth, because this is, this is now our, our, third, our third video of the testimony of truth. And definitely check out the other ones as well, because it gets into this in a lot more detail. But the whole point of the testimony of truth is to say this whole thing that what mainstream Christianity is doing, you know, ma making you have faith, making you be subservient, making you have to, uh, you know, they, they criticize martyrdom, this idea of, oh, well, if you die for Christ, then you'll go to heaven. They're saying, look, this is all bullshit. What it's really about is looking within and realizing that you are divine. And when you realize that you are divine, that is how you become your own savior. And that's exactly what this line says. It says, this therefore is the true testimony. This therefore is the testimony of truth. They're saying, they're, ba they're basically saying, look, what you've been told is a lie. What you've been told about the Garden of Eden is a lie. What you've been told about God is a lie. What you've been told about what you have to do to be saved, that's a lie. Here's the truth. That's why it's called the testimony of truth. This, therefore, is the true testimony. The testimony of truth. When man comes to know himself and God, who is over the truth, he will be saved and he will crown himself with the crown unfading. And I love that line. It's a perfect line. It's a beautiful line. Um, you, it's about crowning yourself. And it's not about ego or narcissism or anything like that, because we will all be crowned, because we will all be our own saviors, and ultimately we are a collective. And that's when it says when man co comes to know himself and know God. It's not God as in some sort of being apart from us, but it's God as ourselves. When you know yourself, you will know God. That's the whole point. And the, the aphorism, know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. So we have this symbol at the center of the medical, uh, medical symbol, and you can see how deeply rooted that uh, religious ideals are in our world. It, you know, they're, they're, they're everywhere. And this is one reason uh, that we really need to look at the effects that religion has. Now, I'm not saying that, oh, well, it's terrible. It's bad because we have a serpent in the, in the, in the center of the star of life. I'm not saying that's a bad thing or anything, but my point is, is that you have things that are just right there in front of people's faces that people never question. Like, well, why is there a serpent in front, you know, in the star of life? And most people don't ask that, even though it's weird. Why, why would that be there? When it's a lot of our society systemically is deeply rooted in religion. Now, that's just an example, though, of something that's not necessarily very harmful, but there are so many harmful things that are systemically rooted in our system that we don't, that people don't question, such as, let's say, you know, traditional roles of men and women, or even like uh, monogamy versus polyamory, or, um, you know, LGBTQ, or whether, you know, whether that's right, you know, human, uh, different human rights, things like this are all embedded in our society systemically that have roots in religion and they're right in people in front of people's faces, but they, they just go, oh, well, you know, just like they don't question why is there a serpent in the center of the star? They just go, oh, well, that's just how it is. And they don't really think about it and go, well, why is it that way? And is it right that it's that way? And maybe we should change it because maybe um, it's better that we live a life that's more future oriented and not based on books thousands of years old written by you know, men who just want dominance and power and to keep humanity in a submissive state. Because this God of the Bible, this what the Gnostics deem as the devil, is simply a projection of men who want power. You had these people who want power and want domination. And when they wrote these stories, 
they projected all of that desire that they had themselves into this idea of a god, their god, because that god embodies everything that they want. That is their projection. So we have this system that society is based on, even though they don't know it, that is run by and rooted in a system written by a patriarchal society that just wanted dominance in the world to submit. And this is why it's incredibly important that we work towards consciously observing and consciously questioning and consciously asking. And again, having a serpent in the center of a star, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are so many things in our world that people don't question and our world uh, starts to crumble because of that. And we have to constantly be questioning and constantly asking, why is it that we do the things that we do? Why is it that society is run the way that it is run? And should it be run that way or should it be run in a different way? And that really concludes The Testimony of Truth, a very interesting book that's very serpentine. There is more to it. But if you can see, it's very fragmented. There's so many pieces missing, missing, missing. There's a little, there, there's little chunks um, here and there. But for the most part, there's there's so much missing that it's difficult to read. Uh, but you can certainly read it if you would like to. There are some very interesting, um, you know, passages here and there, but not really enough to to do an entire video about. But if you enjoyed what we talked about today, check out the whole playlist because there is a lot more. You can check all those out, and. Um, hey, if you like my work, like and subscribe because we want to spread this information, get this information out there. And if you enjoy my work as well, consider supporting on Patreon. Helps out a lot. It's how I'm able to do what I do. You'll be able to be a part of our secret live streams, our hidden Discord server, the Citadel. And I want to give a big shout out to everyone who does support, especially Philanthropist, Zach, Renaissance Fairy, Cassidy, Michael, Angela, Maria, Top of the World, Ethan, DB, and Joel. And because of all your awesome support, uh, I was able to get a new camera, so I'll be setting that up very soon, and hopefully we'll see some uh, improvement in the video quality. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, if you'd like to support us well, you can hit the join button below this video on YouTube. That also helps. Thank you very much, my friends.